I believe I must have been born believing in the full right of women to all the privileges and positions which nature and justice accord to her in common with other human beings. Perfectly equal rights, human rights. There was never any question in my mind in regard to this. I did not purchase my freedom with a price. I was born free. And when, as a younger woman, I heard the subject discussed, it seemed simply ridiculous that any sensible, sane person should question it. And when later the phase of women's rights to suffrage came up, it was to me only a part of the whole, just as natural, just as right, and just as certain to take place. And whenever I have been urged as a petitioner to ask for this privilege for a woman, a kind of dazed, bewildered feeling comes over me. Of whom should I ask this privilege? Who possessed the right to confer it? Who had greater right than the woman herself? Was it a man? And if so, where did he get it? Hello, my name is Susan Philpott and I am a park ranger at the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. Although today I am coming to you virtually at least from the Clara Barton National Historic Site. Those words I just read are from a speech given by Clara Barton about the topic of women's rights. Clara Barton is known for her lifetime of service during the Civil War and then afterwards as the founder of the American Red Cross. But did you know she was also a woman suffragist? That word suffrage means the right to vote. And a suffragist is someone who fights for and agitates for that right. This year, 2020, marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now, if anyone ever tells you that the 19th Amendment gave women the vote, that is not true. No one gave women the vote. They claimed it, like Clara Barton so eloquently said. They fought for it. They won it. All across the country, for over 70 years, women agitated for their rights. Now, some say it started with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other women at the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, in July 1848. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's mission statement, the Declaration of Sentiment, said it pretty clearly. All men and women are created equal. Of course, Seneca Falls wasn't the first time women stood up for their rights, and it wouldn't be the last. For decades, women and men too, like Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Frances Harper, they campaigned for women's rights including the right to vote. Eventually, that first generation saw that they weren't gonna win the battle for the ballot in their lifetimes. So they began to train the next generation so they could take up the fight. Women like Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, Alva Belmont, Anna Howard Shaw, Carrie Chapman Catt, just to name a few. They kept organizing, they kept fighting, and they were trying out new tactics and strategies as ways to win the vote. And eventually even younger women had to join in the fight. Women like Inez Mulholland, Lucy Burns, and Alice Paul. These new women benefited from the fights of the earlier generations. They had more access to things like education and the professions, things that the pioneers had been denied. And these new women began to change the strategy. They were tired of just little by little process, progress, chipping away at uh, their rights, winning limited suffrage here and there in states and municipalities. They began to demand uh, amendment to the constitution, ensuring that no woman could be denied the vote based on sex. And they were joined in this fight by women who wouldn't even benefit from a constitutional amendment because they were denied citizenship. Native American women like Mary Botno Baldwin and Zakala Sa, 
Chinese women like Mabel Pinghua Lee and Tai Lung Schultz. And black women who continued the fight, they found themselves having to fight the white suffrage leaders as well as lawmakers to try and win their rights. And women did all kinds of things. They lobbied, they marched, they protested and picketed. Some went to jail. They went on hunger strikes and were forced fed, but they refused to give up. Once the 19th Amendment became part of the US Constitution, women kept fighting. They fought for equal treatment under the law. They fought for equal pay and the right to serve on juries. They ran for office and they fought to be accepted to universities that refused to admit them. And women who found themselves still denied the vote because of their race or ethnicity, they kept fighting too. Clara Barton died in 1912, so she didn't get to see these new generations of women rising up to demand their rights, the rights she was so sure they already had. But that kind of de fighting determined spirit that Clara Barton showed, it lived on through 1920 and beyond. And those stories don't just live at places like Belmont Paul or Women's Rights National Historic Site, or even at places like Clara Barton National Historic Site dedicated to the stories of women. The stories of women and men demanding their equality and fighting for justice are all across the country. Wherever you are, you can find those stories. So now as we look beyond the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the future, what do you think the next 100 years will bring? What does equality look like to you? And who will be the new activists who rise up and demand their right to be recognized? As the suffragists used to say, forward into light. <laughs>